Topping off today's show, a look at Project Self-Sufficiency in Shreveport. Sonia Massengale has a very fascinating report on jazz great Ellis Marcellus in New Orleans. Then we'll paint for you a portrait of a mime, Troy Broussard, an incredible young man. I'm Rob Hinton. Those stories and more today on Folks. Everybody's just folks. Just plain old folks. Everybody just people all over the world. Oh, folks are living. Folks got to give. Folks got to care. Ooh, folks got to share. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Folks. Our first story today comes from Shreveport and it's all about being independent. Independence is a lot easier for some people to achieve than it is for others. Well today we have a report about a program aimed at helping some single parents who want to become more independent. The program is called Project Self-Sufficiency and here's a look at how it works. The program is designed in such a way that Single parents who are head of household, uh, in many instances, do not have the kind of job training that is necessary to become employed. And the primary objective of this program is to get them employed, put them, take them off the public assistance rolls and put them on the rolls of employment. That's James Adams, director of Shreveport's Department of Urban Development. He also heads the city's self-sufficiency program. There's a variety of training that's available to the participants. We don't have any um, set notions about making decisions for people. What we have done is that the Shreveport Department of Human Resources is also a part of this program. And for all practical purposes, they are the training mechanism that, 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 that provide this program with the kind of expertise necessary to screen individuals, to talk with individuals, to counsel with individuals, to make a determination of what kind of work they would like to do. Once that decision has been arrived at, then we will go and purchase the training necessary in order to meet that desire. Um, so far, we have uh, some participants who, who are in training to be uh, 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 K-Division uh, uh, installers. We have some participants who are in training to, to install telephones. So it's a whole wide range of training that is available. Now, the self-sufficiency program is federally funded, and Shreveport is one of 75 cities in the country to offer it. To qualify, a single parent must have a low income, be on the Shreveport Housing Authority's waiting list, and probably most important, be motivated toward achieving economic independence. Mitzi Douglas is one person benefiting from Project Self-Sufficiency. She is receiving word processing training at a local business college. Tell us what made you decide to get involved in this program. Well, I decided to come and further my studies and learn more about um, the things that I would need to help me in a, my job if I happen to get a job in the word processing business. What do you think about it so far? I think that it's a great experience for me and uh, I feel that it will help me in getting the job that I want and land me just in the right field of what I want to do. Have you ever taken part in any of the uh, job training programs before? No. Do you feel this will help you as far as getting a job once you complete the program? I feel that it will help me. The people who are participating in the program are highly excited about it. Uh, at this point in time we have we have 23 slots allocated to the city of Shreveport to begin this program. 
So far, we have selected nine participants out of the 23. And that was for the funding year of 1984. We are hopeful in receiving 50 additional slots for 1985. And if we receive these slots, we will then uh, be prepared to select 50 more participants in this program. And hopefully, by this being a demonstration program, if it is successful, perhaps we can have this program as a permanent and ongoing uh, program to provide the kind of services that we're talking about here today. Over the years, we have seen a lot of federally funded job training programs. Tell us what makes this one so unique. Well, the thing that makes this one so unique is simply because we have brought together representatives from all of the different areas under one umbrella. Uh, if a person, for an example, would go out and look for a job, and they found that job, they would probably have to go to public assistance to receive some sort of transportation subsidy. Uh, they would have to go to a child care center and seek out child care services. This program brings all of the services, all of the services, excuse me, service, services necessary under one umbrella. And we can, through this program, provide a person with not only job training, but we will provide them with assistance in locating a child care center where they can put their children and provide some subsidy if necessary. We will also provide them perhaps with some subsidy for transportation to get to and fro from work. Uh, we will provide all of these services under one umbrella and the participant would not have to go to seven or eight different places to seek all of these services individually. Will the program turn out to be a success? It's probably a little early to make uh, a complete determination as to whether or not the program is successful. Let me say that <clears throat> the program has progressed uh, above our, our previous uh, 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 anticipation uh, expectations uh, for it. Uh, we see no reason at this time uh, that would that would suggest to us that the program could uh, could fail. The only thing we see at this time, uh, based upon the enthusiasm of the participants, the cooperation of the various agencies that's assisting us with this program, we see nothing but success in the future for this program. Okay, time now for a question from the folks almanac. In 1978, President Carter appointed the first black federal judge in Louisiana and the Deep South. Do you know who he is? We'll tell you later in the program. Marsalis is a respected name in the world of jazz. People who know jazz recognize Marsalis as a name that helped to create the current renaissance of jazz in America. Wenton and Branford Marsalis are young men with a relentless dedication to serious music. But long before the famous brothers came along, there was Ellis. Meet Ellis Marsalis, father of famous sons and a legend in his own right in jazz circles. For nearly 30 years, Ellis has been performing and teaching jazz, inspiring young musicians and raising six sons, supporting his family with music. I knew from very young that I wanted to play music. I don't think I dealt with the professional aspect of it until many years later. It was something that I enjoyed doing and the music profession in the New Orleans area was not structured in a professional way in, in, in terms of what we know the term professional to mean today. You could work, but mostly it was sort of like just hustling. You know, it was like we call a hustle. And the more involved I got with music, the more articulate I found that I needed to be in terms of the knowledge of music, the facility on an instrument, and I had to practice more and study to try and understand the more sophisticated elements of jazz. He studied at Dillard University in New Orleans. After graduating, he joined the Marine Corps. After military service came marriage and eventually the beginning of the modern Marsalis legend. Brantford was born. Bradford and Wynton are 11 months apart. 
And the third and fourth kids are 11 months apart. How did you react to your children uh, wanting to become musicians? I was happy for them. I didn't really have musical aspirations for them. You know, I was not a stage father. And uh, I've thought about that, because people have asked me about that. And I think the reason why I wasn't a stage father was because I never did stop playing. It wasn't like the frustrated athlete who didn't make it to the pros. How did your parents feel about you becoming a professional musician? I had more like cooperation than support. My father was not interested in me becoming a musician. But he bought the instruments, you know, and when I went to school, he paid the tuition when I was at the university. Uh, but they were not that enthusiastic about me being a jazz musician. I didn't think much about professional musician. I sort of dreamed about going to New York. And uh, that was as close as I came to recognizing what it meant to be a professional musician. That is, uh, one of these days, we're going to have to go to New York. This is the dreams of us, you know, the, the guys. And eventually, you begin to find out, unless you make a move at it, it, it doesn't happen. But I think as years went on, and fortunately for me, I didn't lose my skills on the instrument, the idea of one day going to New York sort of kept me going, so to speak. And I think it kept me from losing my skills, even though it was more of an illusion than anything else. Ellis, whose own father didn't really believe in teacher types, has been teaching since the mid-70s at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. A lot of things have changed. First of all, my understanding of music as a profession changed because I was able to look at it from a different perspective. And I was also able to see how much training affected the success of what you did. And I was no longer laboring, well, I don't know if laboring would be the right term. I was no longer influenced by the fall back on theory, which I don't think I ever espoused much to at all. I mean, I went to college uh, and I told my father, I said, I went because you paid the bills. If you wouldn't have paid, I wouldn't have gone. Recently, a quote by Winton about purism in jazz caused a minor stir among jazz musicians and made headlines. The musician least disturbed by the comment was Ellis. Was this theory something that Dad instilled in his son? It was and it wasn't. See, I never considered music that seriously as a profession. So the selling out concept had less to do with me because had I considered music more as a profession, I probably would have gone into pop music. Because growing up in New Orleans, see, you had to play every kind of music there was. And I was a rhythm and blues player long before I even heard it or knew anything about jazz. Do you have a philosophy of life that you live by? For the most part, uh, I guess. I don't know if I've really thought about it and, and, and shaved it down to one sentence or one statement. But I think mine is uh, to just continue trying to grow. You know, do whatever you have to do to maintain that curiosity. Whitten and Branford Marcellus have become household names in jazz, but according to Ellis, the best is yet to come. The littlest one is eight. He seems to be more musical than all of us. Plays drums and violin when he feels like it. And listens to records all the time. Can sing John Coltrane solos. You know, has perfect pitch. Has sat at the piano and pounded out about three of his own songs. I mean, he shows more musical promise than any of the rest of them did at that age. 
you know, but given the kind of society that we live in today, I mean, you just don't know, you know. I mean, I don't, there again, you know, I don't care if he becomes a musician or not. I would just like to see him develop his talent and his skills along the lines which contribute to his personal growth. And if it takes him into music, fine. If it takes him through it on into something else, that's fine also. This is an original composition, a fairly new vintage, entitled On Time. <laughs> Marsalis is finally getting some international recognition. He recently gave a series of concerts in Spain, and he expects to negotiate a tour in Japan sometime next spring. Okay, time now for another folks flashback. This week's flashback takes us to 1982, where folks documented the voters' registration march down LA-1 from Shreveport to Baton Rouge. I think people are uh, so uh, disinterested now in the, uh, the, the, their right to vote uh, mainly because of the economic conditions um, and all kind of other, uh, I guess, oppression that uh, black people might be facing right now. I guess when you register two or three people, you should be happy about it. But when you look at the fact that there are over 350,000 that we have to get, uh, it, it can be a little bit disappointing. Our final story features a young man with a handicap. Some of you might have heard of him. His name is Troy Broussard. You see, Troy is deaf, but his inability to hear has in no way diminished his zest for life.
an event, like getting on and off an elevator. Hear the applause of his audience, although all of his hours of training and preparation are focused upon pleasing them. So for Troy, it is the look of happiness on their faces that makes it all worthwhile. He has found that true communication is heart to heart and requires no words. This is an important message for us all. Okay, time now to answer the question from the Folks Almanac. In 1978, President Carter appointed the first black federal judge in Louisiana and the Deep South. Do you know who he is? Well, the answer is Judge Robert Collins. Well, that's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll be on a holiday for two weeks, but when we return, we'll be featuring more interesting folks, and we hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.